Hi, everyone. If you don't know me already, my name is Michelle Vinokur, and I run my own blog website known as The World of Autism. As you may know, for, the, for over a year now, I've been conducting guest interviews besides publishing blog stories. I've been conducting guest interviews to feature people who are on the autism spectrum, spectrum, who are, or even people that are professionals, therapists, educators, parents, or any, or anybody else really that you know that provide experiences that would be so beneficial for the community. And this is a brand new year. Happy 2022. I know it's been, we've had challenges that have been going on because of COVID and everything, but you know what, we, we're all staying strong and still advocating and educating and everything. So what I, I am so happy to have the next guest on here who is actually starting off the new year. And I'm so happy he is on. His name is Ron. How are you doing, Ron? Great. Thanks so much for having me on your show today. <laughs> Glad you are on. So can you tell a little bit about with yourself, like, like a little brief about with your story? Yeah, so I was diagnosed in 1982 with autism at age seven. When I was diagnosed, it was only one in every 10,000 children were diagnosed with autism. Now it's one in every 59 children who are diagnosed with autism. And um, since then, I've gone on to write three nationally published books. My first book was A Parent's Guide to Autism, Practical Advice, Biblical Wisdom, which became one of the top 10 best-selling Christian books on autism all the time. My second book was on St. Augustine, Thought, Choice, Action. And my third book that came out May 25th is in Barnes & Nobles right now, and it's Views from the Spectrum, A Window in the Faith in Life, Your Neurodivergent Child. And I've been able to speak all around the country, all around the world. I've spoken in gas, I've spoken in eagle. And I, my mascot is a prairie dog named Prairie Pup, who my mom used to help me learn. And we were just talking, and Michelle lives right near where my mom went to college. She went to college at Sarasota Art School in Sarasota. And then she quit her job as an art teacher in 1982 to become a full-time Ron teacher and teach me life skills using a prairie dog. Now I got a new companion. He's in his COVID outfit. Um, he's a honey badger. And my first honey badger on my honeymoon to the Windy City in Chicago. And it was love at first sight. He was in a big window. I growled at him. He growled back. And what I didn't realize with the first one I got is when you press its paw, every F-bomb in the book comes out. So I got an Amazon declawed one that I use when I speak. So mm -hmm. no one thinks that if it goes off, that I'm having a live demonstration of a meltdown. And I've come mm -hmm. a long way. I was in intense speech therapy all the way from age two to 16. At age seven, my speech was so delayed. My brother Chuck said he thought I was from Norway because I spoke Norwegian. Huh. <laughs> That's interesting. Very interesting. And um, it's like, it's just such an incredible story. And now like you are, you've been author of so many books. And now you've been working on, you have another book that you've been working on. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so my fourth book that I'm working on, um, it's going to finish up my trilogy. So my first book, A Parent's Guide to Autism, Practical mm -hmm. Advice, Biblical Wisdom, covers from the time you're a child and you're diagnosed with autism into entering the teenage years. My second book on autism, Views from the Spectrum, covers young adults on the spectrum, also younger kids on the spectrum. And then my fourth book that I'm working on, which is the third book on autism, is called Autism Growth and Transitioning into Adulthood. And I interviewed 50 of the most remarkable people on the autism spectrum while writing it, and 50 of the best well-known uh, professionals in the autism field. And I share beginning with college life and moving out of the home and developing healthy lifestyle choices and how we eat 
um, exercise. I look at developing a hope complex. Many people with autism, about 80% suffer from mental health issues or depression. And I teach how to develop a hope complex to overcome those anxiety and mental health issues. And the chapter I just got finished writing is chapter 10 out of 12, and it's called 20 Hindrances to Transitioning to Adulthood. And one of the main ones I covered it, a lot of people don't think of is it sleep. Um, sleep affects everything we do. Our memory ability goes up 20% when we have a good night's sleep. Our ability to drive, we are 25% less likely to have a car accident when we sleep. And our body is able to regulate itself with blood pressure, with um, breaking down sugar and glucose when we sleep regularly. Our odds of getting diabetes if we regularly sleep eight to nine hours a night go down about 50%. Our odds of getting cancer over a lifetime goes down about 50% if we sleep eight hours or more. But the problem is with us on the spectrum is most of us average six hours of sleep. So we're missing out on the final round of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, when all the memory takes place and our creativity ability blossoms and our ability to do these great things. So that's one of the ones I talk about. A lot of times too, people on the spectrum lack direction. They don't know mm. what they wanna do. They lack the ability to generalize the steps to reach their goals. And in my book, I break everything down in the simple ways. I give 14 ways of better sleep on the spectrum. And, and the, what I do is I make them in, and present them in a way that autistic people can understand is a ritual that they can do at night to help them fall asleep. One thing you can do to fall asleep at night is um, use water, wash your hands with cold water, splash some on your face because when your temperature goes down two degrees, your body automatically goes into sleep mode. It's like your computer, when you leave it on, what happens? It goes into sleep mode and there's things we can do with our own body to help it, like the computer that's programmed, go into sleep mode. And a lot of us on the autism spectrum follow those routines and my book's gonna help them be able to make part of their routine, living a healthier, help, happier life on the spectrum, being able to transition more smoothly from mom and dad's house into their own apartment or into college life in the dorm. I went away to college 930 miles from my house. And I actually had a roommate, Joel Marion from New Jersey. And oh, interesting so enough, funny. he's one of the wealthiest people in all of Tampa now. Bill Air, wow. he was in Bill Air, Tampa. And he's worth over $500 million. He invented a company called BioTrust Nutrients, and they sell more nutrients in the world than anyone else. And what I like to share about him being my roommate is he's also a three-time offer. So I was sleeping right next to a bed in the dorm because we were roommates to an mm -hmm. offer who had published nationally published books just like me. And I <laughs> tend to think, what were the odds of that, that I'd have a roommate yeah. that um, would be a nationally best published author? His book was called... Um, the myth of that eating um, after 7 p.m. Mm. So his books would be great for people on the autism spectrum because many of us struggle with weight issues due to our eating only certain foods. Some people want to eat chicken mm. nuggets. Some people eat only um, French fries or pizza. I interviewed one lady for my third book and her son would only eat Popeye chicken. And she tried to get healthier chicken and put it in a Popeye's box mm -hmm. but the kid on the spectrum knew the difference and had one of those honey badger moments oh. oh when he saw it wasn't the chicken he was expecting yeah yeah I and yeah you brought up some good points about like just even even the thought about with sleeping like how much that you know it is one of the big issues that for people with autism is about with sleeping i know for me growing up that actually was not an issue but it's different yeah way. but when it comes to food food i know i struggled that with that too in terms of like how you know a lot of it was texture 
that's why yeah. you know a lot of people on the spectrum still deal with that is because um with sensory and when it comes to the texture of the food that the way it, it when the way that it tastes like is in your mouth and stuff it's like you know not everybody handles it well but I know personally for me, it took me till high school to learn to eat like healthy, like any vegetables or even meat. I used to be the same way. I would eat like, I'd eat like pizza, macaroni, cheese, peanut butter, and jelly sandwiches. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I know <laughs> this, this makes my mom laugh so much. Like whenever I uh, try to sneak in like food, like she used to, and she still does it sometimes, but I, I've gotten used to pretty much eating all of the food that my mom eats now. So like my mom cooks, but yeah. Uh, so like when I was learning to eat vegetables and I hope that this helps for anybody with this is that like trying to like, eat like, um, how can I put the word? Uh, kind of like puree or like, in a way sneak in the food like into like whatever your whatever their favorite like food is and you can still make it like healthy in a way to slowly add in or another technique is that if if they learn to if someone learns to take like a couple of bites of a new food then they could still enjoy their favorite food just to slowly transition to because I that's worked for me it has worked for me and I hope that it can help work for others too because yeah these are some things that as you keep growing up and everything that for the future because it can affect health wise you know you yeah and it catches up with you when you get older like I used to be able to eat everything when I was in college I used to drink about three Mountain Dews a day I drink um Pepsi because we had them in the college I went in, in the dorm and then now that I've gotten older, I haven't had a pop now going on one year. I haven't had a Coca-Cola in eight years because I, I got such bad acid reflux that I've had to reevaluate. And us on the spectrum, we have way more digestive issues, GI issues than any group, a minority group. So then that's when it catches up with us. And our digestive issues will affect our mind with depression or anxiety. So it's very important once we get older to start, um, once our metabolism slows way down, to start eating foods that are meant for a slow metabolism. I heard one guy say it best, he said eating um, greens like lettuce, broccoli, it sets your digestive system. It's like the startup tune in a car when you turn it over. And if you can start eating those first, then your digestive system will produce less acid reflux and you'll be more prepared for the meal and not have all the painful after effects. And a lot of people on the spectrum like spicy foods and certain foods that fried foods and they all affect that GI issue, which um, later on um, will affect our quality of life. They did a survey yeah. who were the, the happiest people in the world. Was it the healthiest and then what they discovered is the happiest people in the world were also the hap or were also the happiest so health equals um quality of life yeah and also the fact that uh like besides with sleep and besides with like healthy eating also the benefit of exercising because that's another issue right there is that getting enough movement you know um, luckily I have a friend, like I know a friend who lives here in Florida in Tampa. I think you know Mark. Mark, right? Yeah. Yes. I know Mark real well. Yeah. Yeah. I have an article written about him and he's a good friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like it, to be able to, um, that's the thing, like for people with disabilities, just to about movement, it's an yeah. issue, like to be able to help with moving around and just, you know, because that's also another key to a good quality of life and also improving, like, like to combat, like, with any mental health issues that can occur, because as you said, it, we're 80% of people that are on the autism spectrum, 
a lot of people have like a side like mental health issue like with depression and stuff so like all these things can combat any issues and also it just makes it also just helps improve like quality with uh mood and just everything in general just like it being like just to promote more positivity of life you know yeah and um one of the other things i talk about too is it um about 70 percent of young adults with autism they don't even have driver's license and they they're too afraid to take um driving courses and with the united states unlike the uk is we don't have a mass transport system so a lot of young adults with autism it'll affect their being able to go to college and i talk about how to learn how to drive also the rule of the land a lot of people with autism don't know how to respond if they get pulled over they don't know how to respond mm -hmm. when they um get in a car accident and clay marzel one of the great surfers fourth best freestyle surfer he got in a car accident he knew how to drive and he got out of the car and went running in the woods and his girlfriend was with him at the time and the guy comes up and says where's the driver and she said well he freaked out because he has asperger's so a lot of that stuff I'm teaching in my book and bringing it out in practical ways so people can apply it. So what I did with my book is I have three parts to the book. Number one, I have the, the um, information side and on the chapter. Number two, I have reflection questions for a group. And then I have actual activities you can do to learn those skills. And then finally, I have a story of someone unique on the autism spectrum or someone who's doing something in the autism community that applies to those lessons taught. And I have a whole chapter on um, dating and relationships, avoiding the pitfalls of relationships and share mm -hmm. with how people can learn those skills and be able to develop them and know how to um, date safe. Because a lot of people on the <laughs> spectrum um, will do um, behavior where it can um, put them in dangerous situations. They may go home with someone who they just met being naive, mm -hmm. or they may do something that they think is appropriate where it's not appropriate in that context. So it goes through all those things. And most books on autism and transitioning adulthood are written for the parents or for people working in the field. I made mine ex written for the autistic from the autistic. So it brings it out more. And um, it also looks at it from a different angle than a lot of the books out there. Uh, that, I, that, I couldn't agree with you more right there because of the fact that you have, you like pretty much pointed out different, not only just about with audience members, you know, just like the different perspectives in terms of like, you got like, where you're providing advice, you have where you got different like activities for people to actually apply these lessons yeah. about these skills. Like that is so important because the fact that like like that a lot of I know personally myself and I maybe other people could relate about this um that about with being able to apply skills in real life situations like for me, growing up, I could be very knowledgeable and like, and like ace tests, but then going to apply something like for real is like, wow, this is, you know. <laughs> yeah, we have difficulty generalization. That's why I make that, all the tasks yeah. visible. So you're actually seeing what you're doing and thinking about it and working them together. Because yeah. um, we only remember 20% of stuff that we, um, see or hear but stuff what we work on with the visual side for people with autism we memorize about 60 70 percent so it's higher than the general public but our actual audio ability is only about a tenth of what most people's are most um 90 percent of people with autism learn visually temple grandin says and i've presented with her before very cool yeah i i did i was very fortunate i did meet meet Dr. Temple Grandin. It was a couple of years ago. I think, yeah, like a couple of years ago, it was back in New Jersey when I was still living in New Jersey. It was for a um, 
for an autism organization, they had an event where they actually brought Dr. Temple Grand to perform a speech, and I did. I was fortunate; I got to meet her in person. And everything she's awesome. Such yeah, a cool person. I looked out because I was one of the presenters, so mm -hmm. they allowed me to have twenty minutes alone, just talking to Temple Grand, and I introduced her to Prairie Dog and the Honey Badger, and have pictures with her. She said they shoot a prairie dog because she works with cattle and the prairie dog would break their legs. <laughs> She's oh my a God. Hoot. And I actually had the pleasure of having her sit in one of my um, presentations on autism athletics. And she sat through about half hour of the hour presentation. So I was excited, nervous though, because there's about 250 people, 300 people. And then they have her sitting in there. I wasn't nervous mm -hmm. with the other people, but with her there, made it more nerve acting right wow that is that's very cool that is very cool and um it's so exciting about with with all the work that you've been doing so far and the latest book that you have coming out do you know the um actually it might be a, <laughs> i was going to ask you like when do you think it's going to come out you know it'll probably come out in a year and a half the reason is is every book that i publish once I get a publisher, mm -hmm. it takes another year before it comes out. And mm -hmm. um, I wait till I'm finished with my book, then I get it to my agent, and mm -hmm. then um, my agent finds a publisher for me. And that usually takes about three months. And then from the time mm -hmm. that I sign on, it takes a year because they got to market it. Um, um, traditionally, published books like mine take a lot longer to get out than um, self published. That's but all my books are traditionally published. And two of them are big um, traditional publishers. And then one was a, a um, smaller market because books on theology are, you know, unless you're a well-known theologian, they don't mm -hmm. sell as well. So I had to get a smaller traditional publisher for my book on theology. My books on autism, though, I always have publishers contacting me and um, <laughs> my agents. So those are pretty easy to get out. <laughs> Wow, that's awesome. Very cool. Uh, I cannot wait for for your latest book to come out. And you have, right now you have all the rest of the books on Amazon, right? Yeah, they're on Amazon, um, all three of them. And then um, you can go to the um, Barnes & Noble website and they're all three on Barnes & Noble website. But in the actual stores, only the two on autism were in the actual stores. And that's I got awesome. pictures of me in Barnes and Nobles holding up a copy that they had in there. So what I do is when you get a book in Barnes and Nobles now, it's only mm -hmm. there for about the yeah. first four or five months. So I always make sure I go right away, get my picture in Barnes and Noble with it so that it's um, still in there when I get the picture. <laughs> All right, cool. So for those of you that want to be able to purchase to read any of Ron's books, make sure that you get them on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Very, yeah, thanks. Very cool. Uh, now I kind of want to transition now a bit to, because I found out also another very cool thing about with you, Ron, is about your website, Spectrum. Can you tell more about that? Yeah, so my website, Spectrum Inclusion, gets about 10,000 views a month. It's one of the main ones on autism, and it mm -hmm. um, offers resources to empower young adults to um, independence and employment. One that only 3% of people with autism are gainfully employed in the United States. So mm -hmm. I offer videos, I offer resources, and um, I put um, on my Facebook fan page, which is Spectrum Inclusion, after the website, that's where I post all my speaking events. This week I'm speaking at Oakland University to a group of young adults on the autism spectrum on becoming a national published author on the spectrum. And I'm always speaking somewhere or doing an event somewhere. We were just talking about Mark. There's a church in Ohio where Mark, um, or not a church, there's a gym in Ohio, I meant to say, where um, they're using a similar program to what Mark is using. And she had told me she had talked to Mark about her program, Mark had shared on hers. So I'll probably be going to Ohio to speak to her group at the gym. They have about 100 clients who come out. So I'm always somewhere um, doing a speaking engagement. February has been slow because of COVID. March, mm -hmm. I've got a bunch of big 
um, events where I'm speaking. April always fills up quickly. Um, <laughs> this year it's been slower because of COVID in a lot mm -hmm. of places. They don't know if they're going to be live or virtual, so they're waiting mm -hmm. to give me that answer. Very cool. That is awesome to hear about even just with your with you being a speaker and everything, like for how much you've been doing. That is great. That is so great to hear and just to know about with about with your website, like not just about like sh like sharing about yourself, but the fact that you also give um that you give some tips on there when it comes to navigating with employment and everything. Because Yes, there's still a lot of people that um that are on the autism spectrum that are still not employed or or they're even working like minimum wage. So yeah, and more people die working in the grocery store percentage-wise who are on the autism spectrum than any other minority group. And it's one of the things they're not talking about. And they actually uh, met with the head of the CDC saying mm -hmm. this is appalled, this is horrible. And they need to change that because a lot of people with autism, they're underemployed for their gifts. Um, one of the places I speak, one of the young adults who attends that um, group actually passed away. Wave one, when COVID was way more strong, they passed away from it. Oh. Now, COVID has become more of just a flu. Luckily, yeah. the Omicron yeah. variant isn't as strong. So, yeah. Wow, I am so sorry for your loss about what that, wow, wow. But yeah, it's still so important to advocate like with companies to hire people with autism and with disabilities because uh, just the fact of trying to make a living and to be able to get towards like goals of like independent living in your own place to just to be economically stable, you know? So yeah. great points from that. So now I wanna wrap up this awesome guest interview. I wanna wrap it up with, um, what would be one tip that you wanna give to, uh, to autistic people that wanna become their authors themselves? What would be one tip? So my one tip is this, is an offer, is only as good as their editor. Make sure you have great editors around you. And this tip is a main one. Getting a book published is more about marketing than it is about writing. So build a platform, um, do speaking engagements, figure out who your audience is, figure out a niche that's smaller than that audience, but is big. So, you're, so my niche or audience is Christians who have children on the autism spectrum. So it's a huge market because there's over a hundred million Christians. So you figure a hundred million Christians mm -hmm. and um, 2% of people are on the autism spectrum. So you're looking at 2 million people in the United States. And if I can get one in every thousand to buy the book, I'm already up to about 5,000 in sales or more. So that's kind of find that niche and find how to market that niche and build a platform, and then you'll be able to publish your book. There you go. There you go. The, I can agree with you. The key is not even, like, yes, writing is important, but it is marketing. <laughs> That's how you're going to get yeah. it out there. You have to promote it. You really do. You really do have to promote it if you're going to get your story out there. Great point right there. I want to thank you, Ron, so much for coming on today to share your story and to tell about the work that you've been doing, especially with the latest book. Can't wait for that to come out. Oh, thanks so much. And thanks for having me there. Just <laughs> wish you. I was in Tampa where it's warm. <laughs> yeah. 